Hey, Good Smackers, and welcome back to the Good Smack Podcast brought to you by Hey So Sure Good. I'm your host, Cindy J. And I'm Kate Hauser, and we're here to talk some smack. Good smack, of course. Each episode, we interview leaders, business owners, and thought provokers in the world of sustainability and social good in hopes of inspiring you to do some good through more mindful, conscious habits. Sometimes all we really need is a good smack to wake us up to the issues facing our world and small steps that we can take to help give back. So Cindy J, are you ready to talk some smack? Yes, I am. Let's do it. Welcome back to the Good Smack for the Planet podcast. Today, we're here with Mia Vons, founder of Good Neighbor Gardens. Thank you so much for being here with us, Mia. Oh, it's an absolute honor. This is so much fun. Mia spearheaded Good Neighbor Gardens to turn San Diego's home yards into edible gardens and make San Diego a major urban food producing hub. Um, So we started Good Neighbor Gardens to do exactly that, to help everyday people learn how to grow their own food in their yard. Mia excitedly started telling us about why people wanted a garden in their backyard. They, you know, they've, something in their life has triggered them to kind of wake up and think, hey, I want to eat as healthy as I can. Um, maybe it was a, um, some sort of a health issue in their family or just they want to be a part of the solution of creating a better world where people have access to good, healthy food. So those folks would tend to subscribe to our what we call Harvest Share, which is essentially mimics a CSA, which stands for Community Shared Agriculture. And what's nice is that these folks who have elected to grow food in their yard and basically host this program are gracious. And we call them gracious neighbors because they're willing to share their surplus so that food is accessible and available at an affordable price to everyone. So that's kind of what we do. And we do take a portion of our proceeds to, we dedicate it towards education. And traditionally we have done that with elementary schools. So we've served about 14 elementary schools here in the San Diego County area over the last seven years. Um, But with COVID-19 and schools not being in right now, we're trying to take that education just like everyone else online and virtual and finding um, small social distance ways to connect to the earth. So that's what we do. That's so cool. So how did Good Neighbor Gardens come about? Were you always a gardener? No, actually. <laughs> I was a financial planner for, oh. 20, for 24 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, for 24 years. So I raised my daughter, who's now 29, almost 30. Um, as a financial planner, I worked from home. I was essentially self-employed, but I did work for a financial planning firm. Um, but we were all considered sort of independent. And so, you know, I just, I knew that I was put on this earth to do something of purpose and not to say that that helping people with financial security wasn't important and that didn't I didn't feel useful or helpful in that way I just knew that deep down there was something more in my soul that was more about developing community and having neighbors love neighbors and I just you know when I was younger Martin Luther King was my best friend you know I just thought wow like I want to be like that I want to do something for the greater good so honestly, I, I began to pray to live in my purpose. And I was dating a man at the time, and he and I committed to doing this together and um, really kind of found ourselves digging in the dirt. I mean, the first gift that he offered me when we were dating is he said, can I build you a garden? Oh, <laughs> I know, I know. And it was the most formidable thing that's ever happened in my life. And I just thought that is the sweetest thing anyone's ever offered me. Like, yes you know and so i love that he took yeah. he took bringing you flowers just like one <laughs> it was like you know I, the food that we so we plant every seed every seedling that we planted together um we prayed over and we just had great hope and expectation it was sort of an expression of our love and it was so bountiful like beautifully bountiful but we had so much food we couldn't eat it all so the tragedy is that we ended up composting about two thirds wow. to grow. And I just, something in my spirit said, you know, we, this is, we need to share this food. Like this is an expression of our love and our faith and our dedication. And this food has love in it. Like I want to share this. I don't want to compost this. And he said, well, honey, don't worry about taking stuff back to the earth. That's a good thing too. But yeah, you're right. And I said, I think we're supposed to start something here. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that's how Good Neighbor Gardens was born. It was kind of born out of our love story and out of our experience of um, 
just dedicating ourselves to our to living a life of purpose and we haven't turned back we're super connected in, in in this work to this day we're together every day doing what what you see we're doing in the world so feeding lots of people and growing lots of food <laughs> that's the most amazing love story um i've heard in a while <laughs> I know. And it gets Your back love to the was grown in a garden. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, and it's taught us so much about how we are loved. I mean, you know, the plants, just like us, we wake every day, and somehow we we stand up. You know, like the plants are erect in the morning when you see them; they're standing up. Like you know, like when you do yoga and your your mm -hmm. hands are lifted, and it's like you're a sun funnel. Well, that's what the plants look like. You know, they taught mm -hmm. us how to. They teach us how to live. You know, and so they they they're up and they're ready to receive, and it's just it's just there's so many stories that i can tell you that about how the garden you know teaches us how to live and one of the greatest joys of doing this is that i get to work with young people who want to also grow food and they want to become experts in the vocation of doing so and they want to teach others and inspire others because they're inspired so it's just been a real gift to be able to hire people train them and have them establish conscious relationships with people who want to grow food in their yard and for them to sort of mentor and nurture that and cultivate life with them and it's just been exceptionally beautiful like i'm just on a wild ride <laughs> that's so cool i have a i have a quick question i think for those of us who aren't gardeners by nature or even learned how does it actually work so let's say i'm a homeowner or i have an apartment i have some land and i know nothing about it do we reach out to you and then you come basically grow a garden for us? Yeah, so the way it works, and there is a little bit of a, um, you know, myth about it when you go to our website, because people are like, well, so do you just like pay to install a garden and teach me? And, you know, so we are not a not-for-profit. We don't have, you know, we're not funded to be able to take this service to people who aren't, who don't have the ability to, to pay for it at this time. So most people, when they go to our website, there's a link that says grow food. And these are folks who want to start a garden, but maybe they don't have the inclination or the time or the know-how. So we are the experts. We'll come in, soup to nuts, we'll install a garden for you based on whatever vision you have and the parameters of your space, whatever it allows. Um, but that is something that the homeowner pays for. It's like we're landscaping your property. And mm -hmm. instead of putting, you know, grass and shrubs, we're putting in harvest box, you know, garden boxes and um, fruit trees. Okay, and then what we do is we give the homeowner the option to take us on as a maintenance um, crew. So that basically affords them their own personal farmhand who'll show up for an hour a week at a minimum. Some people go for a bigger maintenance plan um, to pretty much progress the garden forward. And in doing so, we can work alongside the homeowner or they can even just read the reports that we leave because we do leave a report every time we come of exactly what we did what's harvest ready, what we see, what we recommend. Um, and so in that way, people can learn even if they're not physically with us in the garden. And then basically it's the homeowner's garden. They're paying a fee for the service, but if ever there's too much, and when it's done professionally, there's always too many like, you know, jalapeno peppers. Like how many jalapeno peppers can you actually eat? You know, right. the plant wasn't designed to produce enough for one homeowner, you know, cause the plant doesn't look at ownership the way we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, you know, the homeowner's like, oh my gosh, get, can you do something with these jalapenos? They're going to go bad. I feel terrible. You know, well, great. Cause there's lots of people who love jalapenos okay. and we're going to come in once a week on Wednesday morning and we're going to harvest those, take it back to our urban barn and assemble these wonderful harvest boxes that we will then distribute to people who have subscribed online to receive these boxes bi-weekly. And that's how we, um, basically operate is we give the homeowner a subsidized maintenance fee for the opportunity to to monetize the surplus and distribute it to others and then a portion of the proceeds traditionally we have dedicated towards um, school garden education and of course with COVID-19 we're morphing that education component into other ways of, of doing so that's kind of how it works. So from uh, gardening to becoming a woman entrepreneur I had so many questions in my head that it all came out garbled. I asked Mia to explain more about her journey in building a sustainable business, one that focuses on creating food surpluses and reducing waste in an urban environment. Could this be the new local sustainable business model for the food space, I wondered? 
Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is when you look at all the surplus food in San Diego, especially because we have a year round growing season, you know, that we're very blessed that way. Not every state or city can say that. So when you consider that we have the ability to grow food year round and that so much food is literally dropping to the ground in people's yards. I mean, the fruit trees alone, the fruits just fall all over the place. If we just were willing to create a system where we could harness all of that goodness and distribute it to one another, it doesn't have to cost so much and it doesn't have to, um, you know, when, when everybody kind of gets in where they fit in, whether they want to be a, host for a garden, whether they want to be a farmhand, whether they want to be a distributor, it's all possible. So yes, it is a viable business and it's viable because people are willing to do their part. Um, if you think about it, it's almost like, I hate to say this, but it's almost like we have a free farm, you know, because people are willing to pay for the supplies, they're willing to pay for the installation, they're paying for the water. So we're basically just, and they're paying for the maintenance, so they're paying for the labor. We provide the seeds and seedlings and we provide the labor um, but it makes it affordable. So yes, it is a viable business. We've installed over 195 gardens in wow. the last seven years. We've distributed food to thousands and thousands of people. Currently, our distribution is about 85 packages per week. So that's about a, uh, 100 and what is that? 170, um, sometimes more um, that we distribute. Um, you know, every other week. So what is that? I don't know. Like. For almost 400 packages a month that we're distributing. And prior to COVID-19, it was only 70. Oh, wow. Um, so we've really kind of grown exponentially, almost five, more than five times um, because people are feeling more food insecure. And people are calling us, you know, please come get my apples. I've got apples are going to fall to the ground. You know, my, my apricots only last two weeks. Please come get them. Um, you know, we've got so many lemons here and they're falling to the ground. So there's food out there. There's no reason why we should need, we should feel that we have to be, you know, malnourished and eat food that was trucked in from whoever knows where, from however far away, you know, that isn't any more nutrient dense. Like we can all have nutrient dense food and hunger, the way I look at hunger now is it's sort of redefined as being, um, you know, malnourishment or, um, you know, did this, did getting this food deplete the earth and deplete our resources or did it help to regenerate them? So it's, we're, we're living in a new paradigm and we have to kind of behave accordingly if we want to continue to live here on this planet. I mean, that's, yeah, there's a sense of urgency and a real conviction behind what we're doing, um, not to get too heavy, but, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of how things need to, to go. And I'm not saying that we want to take over where traditional farms are concerned, but we definitely can help produce a percentage of our diet um, in a responsible way and build conscious relationship with one another in the midst of doing so by farming together in, in our in our spaces where we live you know it's just it builds community it cultivates community it cultivates life on so many levels yeah I don't think I, sure. question. I love that I love that I, I'm glad that you brought up the COVID-19 impact though I was actually going to ask you how it's impacted your business because I could see it being a positive growth for you because people are so much more, they want to be more self-sufficient and they want to trust the food they put in their body and maybe not go into the grocery store as much. Um, how do you think COVID-19 has impacted the world of just sustainability in general? You know, it, it, people are actually a lot more, I'm finding this is a time of humility. People are starting to realize that being outside and being free to just be able to go and you know, connect with the earth, go to the beach, go to the mountains, take a hike, walk with a, with a friend, look down the street, you know, touch a tree, you know, people are starting to appreciate that more. People are spending more time outside with their families. They're valuing it more. So I think it's, it's really helped us because I think people are kind of awake, like in wanting this. We're about to start a new program called the, um, a soulful green practice where we're bringing people into other people's yards to work alongside the farmhand in a social distance way. So only like three people at a time at six feet apart to help progress certain gardens that are big forward so that um, we, our gardens can become more productive and also people can get the experience of having that connection with the earth so they're not suffering from nature deficit disorder. So I'm, people have been urging me to do this. And so that's kind of what COVID-19 has done is it's like brought people closer to our project um, personally. So it's kind of our time, you know, we're considered essential, which because we're producing food, 
but also I think people, you know, that's the governmental bodies consider us essential, but I think people are starting to understand how essential it is to be outside and to be connected to the earth or at least eat healthy because they're concerned about their health during these times too. They want to stay, they want to buoy their health. So I think it's, it's really helped us. Um, the downside is that we've had to make adjustments in the way that we do business because of COVID-19. So whereas we used to have host sites where people would pick up their food, we've had to move to uh, distributing to your home and that's costing more because we have to buy some, buy you know materials to package things and that are you know responsibly disposable or recyclable or compostable and that's actually kind of eaten into our margin a little bit so we're going to move back to the host site distribution so there's good there's opportunities and there's threats and we we're, we're negotiating that all the time um, but i think we're finally getting going to get back to a point where we feel that what we do is viable and has a margin, you know, so that we continue to, can continue to do our good work in the world. Yeah, and I think for the, well, it, it's a great timing, like you say, because sure, like you say, government thinks it's essential what you're doing, but the reality is one of the big misses perhaps for all of us is a disconnection with food um, and, and understanding. And I, I can imagine, because I try to grow some stuff and you had said like, just the, the beauty of walking out and seeing your plants but then it's making that connection with people about where their food comes from because i think we're so used to big grocery markets we don't always think about where our food comes from um, and i think that's so key and that is so essential because once you like you say once you realize that you understand how food affects you not just in terms of just sustenance but also in terms of your mental health yeah yeah. You know, I feel personally responsible right now during this climate of Black Lives Matter to make sure that I um, provide historical um, evidence of how Black lives have mattered, right. Black and brown lives, and how we have stewarded the land here and how we've built its gardens and how we fed the nation. And, and so I, my activism really is to bring out spiritual and um, historical wisdom of my ancestors and um, people don't know where their food comes from and they don't realize how much of their food comes from people of color, you know, who have for centuries, you know, been the ones to grow the food, you know. Um, and so that's important. This week, we, we put an insert in our harvest boxes every week when we do our distribution and this, we always reserve a space for art, uh, you know, to feature an artist. But instead of featuring art and artists this week, we're going to feature the hands that feed you. And so we took a oh. picture of you know, our, our, our garden installer's hands. And we took a picture of our, you know, um, our farm hands eyes, you know, these are the eyes that see so that they can grow food for you. You know, it's really important for people to understand that yes, their food come, you know, where does their food come from in terms of distribution of resources, but also where does your food come from in terms of the hearts and the hands and the souls and the spirits and the eyes of those people that actually manifest it for you. So, yeah. That's, Beautiful. I also love that you, you're training people though. Like one of the other things beyond just like people have now a food garden in their yard, which they didn't have before, or you buy a CSA box, but on, in between all of this, you're also training lots of people to learn about gardening. So even if you don't want to, at least you see it every day and you, you say you get a report out, but you're also, in addition to that, training people who want to learn. That is huge, I feel like, in this day and age of just, I think, corporate farming um, that still we're trying to combat. So how, how is that working out? Like, do you, I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of people who really want to also learn how to farm, but there's no place to go. Yeah, I mean, even if you just, like you say, have a balcony or something, you know, we, you can set up a container garden. I mean, tomatoes can grow in like a cardboard box. Like they, they don't need, you know, they're, they're weeds. They really, you know, you don't need, and everybody wants a tomato plant. Like that's sort of the gateway drug to, to, to gardening. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I like it. You know, but yes, there's a book on like tomato diseases, but, you know, over a couple of seasons, that tomato can continue to produce food. And um, it'll weather through there. They're long livers. They can suffer through and still fruit. I mean, I've seen tomatoes, plants that have no leaves and just have fruit hanging off them. You know, it's like, how do they do that? You know, I thought they needed to photosynthesize. Well, yeah, but somehow these tomatoes just want to live, you know. So it's fun to train people because then we're like basically creating the world we want to live in. Because as you learn to grow food, which is like the, the most simple basic practice, something happens where you're like, become this very curious 
person where you're like everything, you know, curiosity is the beginning of your intelligence, right? So it's like, well, why is it doing that? Well, what is that? What kind of bug is that? You know, what kind of weed is that? Is that good or is that bad? You know, and then all of a sudden you're in it, right? You are just in it and you can't get, you're not going to get out. Trust me, you're going to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like once you plant this, once you plant the seed in their brain, no pun intended, it just <laughs> continues to grow. And then they just exactly. keep wanting to learn and understand everything. Exactly. And it's fun to feel that spatial orientation, you know, to be able to feel like you're connected to nature. And then and then you start to hear little messages from nature. Like you start to see the things that you didn't, would never see before. Like, oh my gosh, look at that mushroom coming out. And that we look at that as the soil bloom and it's ind indicative that the soil is alive, you know? And, and that, you know, how alive is it? And you start asking questions. Well, did you know that there are more living organisms in one handful of soil than all the human beings that were ever born on the face of the earth? You start uh -huh. considering that you're like, wow, so it really is alive. And that's what's supporting this plant. You know, and all those same organisms live on your skin. Like you're a host to those same organisms. And so before you know it, you're becoming a scientist or you develop a conscious relationship with, with this, you know, cucumber plant because you've been tending to it every day and looking to see whether the flowers got pollinated and whether the flower turns into the fruit. And all of a sudden you've got this conscious relationship that then you can then translate to your relationship with your child or your family member. You know, I have to just apply that same patience or I have to just apply that same, you know, expectation of good and hope, you know, to my relationship with my son who I might be struggling with right now for whatever reason, you know. So it just becomes like a way of life. It, it really becomes this like parent, teacher, mentor, friend, mother, daughter, student relationship, your relationship with the garden. And, you know, if when we tr distribute this food, someone says, oh my God, that's so good. We know we made the connection. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. I'm like, I'm like, what is that? I don't even know the quote, but it's like, teach a man, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to teach a man a fish, he'll eat for life or something. Yeah. Teach a woman to fish. That's right. Um, but I feel like it is, yeah, teach a woman a fish. <laughs> woman with a Y. Um, but I honestly think it's like, yeah, like you've like the amount of people that you're teaching and passing down. I mean, you said you have what, almost 200 gardens now that you've set up? Well, we've in installed over 200 gardens for people in their yards. Some have taken them over themselves. So maybe someone will stay with us for a year yeah. or two or three or five, you know, depending on what they, what they choose, because some people like the personal service of having their own farm hand, right? Some people like right. to learn and then they want to take it on themselves. And sometimes people move. Yeah. So on our regular weekly yeah. maintenance schedule, we have about 40 gardens that we maintain on a weekly basis. And I would say that that kind of like is pretty consistent. Some people will drop, other people will come on. So it's pretty consistent. And the longest tenure I'd say for people has been the full seven years. Uh, we really haven't had anybody drop after, you know, before like a year, but it's, it's, it's just fun. It's fun to, there's plenty of work out here. Like, there's room for yeah. competitors you know it's like I, I you know <laughs> yeah. as as we're all out growing and we're all out stewarding the land we can live here you know so I don't care like come on in like there's room right and where you yeah. fit in yeah well, well community yeah it's amazing because um in some ways I think going back to what you had said about you know or people talk about food shortage but if you think about every single garden, like when I go on my walks or a run and I pass all these yards, and if you think all of those become not the entire yard, but just even partially a garden, I mean, just imagine that world. So as you're talking, it's just amazing because I love the concept of your own personal farmhand because I feel like it's almost like you're demystifying farming. Right. Which right. for all of us, it's this romantic ideal of like, oh, one day I want to buy a farm. And I'll go there. And I'll grow some chickens. But then people don't realize how much work it is. And you really need people to help and support you. And yeah. if, you could just, if we all just did a little bit in our home or apartment, like you say, pots, I mean, you that's it's phenomenal. Hey there. Yep. This is not how our typical Good Smack podcast interviews end. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't shorten this conversation with Mia, Kate, and myself. If you listened to this first part, you got to hear about Mia's work with Good Neighbor Gardens and what a unique social enterprise she has created to bring the culture of growing food back to our homes. But what she talks about next was so surprising to me and so important for us to hear that I had to keep it. So I made Mia's good smack about community giving and the planet continue in part two.
You've got to hear her talk about what it means to be a Black Lives Matter farmer today, why asking to give away other neighbors extra vegetables is her giving, and how happy soil makes for happy people. If you want to feel your heart soar, even for a second, listen to part two of Mia. It's like a free masterclass on gardening and being a good human being. Thanks for listening to this episode of Good Smack. We hope you've enjoyed talking smack with us. And don't forget to check out Hey Social Good, Hey Sogo for short, to learn about all of the other awesome brands out there giving back to the world and our planet. Until next time, Good Smackers.